Time to get down to business. This is Made in Germany. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin, and here's what's on the agenda. Piping hot, Germany's steel workers demand more money. Strikes are in the works. Firmly anchored, we'll visit a company that makes sure every nail, stud, and screw stays put. And driven by the wind, container ships that save energy by hoisting a sail. We begin with a building project that goes far beyond bricks and mortar. The severe recession in Germany's construction industry back in the 90s taught companies that the only way to survive is to go global and to think out of the building box. Gone are the days when construction companies earned their money solely by erecting new structures. Today, it's all about financing and supplies. Case in point, Germany's construction giant Hochtief. The company nailed down a huge contract in Chile to extend the highway around the capital Santiago. But the project includes more than bridges, asphalt and ramps. Hochtief is also financing the highway. In fact, the company now generates 40% of its revenue through so-called all-inclusive contracts, which continue to generate money decades after the cement dries. When it beeps, you've paid. It's a new and improved way of paying tolls. Rüdiger Trenkle is proud to be using the new Vespucio Orbital Motorway in Santiago de Chile. He was in charge of building it. There are three lanes, but you can move about freely. Here you can see the next toll station. You can change lanes under the toll bridge and still be registered by the machine. The German construction company Hochtief completed work on the motorway in 2006. Hochtief has been running it since then with a license from the government. The license lasts for 30 years, which will give Hochtief the opportunity to recoup the 500 million euros it invested in the project. It's installed state-of-the-art data recording equipment along the highway. The computer enables us to identify the vehicle, classify it, and then bill it. This maintenance worker shows how the radio signal and camera image provide the computer with information. Someone could come along and say, I'm going to buy a transponder for a compact car and then attach it to a truck. But this system would classify it and check on it. It will later be verified by the database. It's done by cameras on the top of the toll bridge. The bridge's intelligent technology should find the right tariff for every vehicle and catch out any toll dodgers. This trip costs 107 pesos, just under 15 euro cents. To drive the entire 30 kilometers of the highway costs around one euro. This is the lighting for the head-on photograph. That's infrared. And that's the camera that photographs the number plates. If there's suddenly a whole load of vehicles coming in one go like now, different kinds of vehicles and then maybe six cars come and five of them have a transponder and one doesn't, then the system has to be able to recognize them all at the same time. Which is the one without a transponder? Which car do I need to take a photo of? He doesn't like you, does he? He doesn't seem to like us, no. Hochtief has had to branch out. Customer service is now an everyday part of the job. The company has become a service industry. This is something that we at Hochtief have never done before. Built a call center that from one day to the next has to deal with 350 or 300,000 customers a month. We have to send out bills, and of course, if something's not right, the customers are going to complain. It's a challenging job. Now Rüdiger Trenkler wants to show us the newest Hochtief project. We're headed for the Cerro San Cristobal, a mountain in the center of Santiago. A tunnel is being built that will cut through the mountain and make the drive via the ring road into the city shorter. 
At the moment, you have to drive around the mountain and come out on the other side. We want to go straight through into the center of town. But there'll only be time to visit the tunnel later this evening. The Hochtief manager still has some meetings. The German Chilean Hochtief executive board is holding a strategy meeting. The managers need to raise 70 million euros for the new tunnel project. And that means a long, hard fight with the banks behind closed doors. It's hard to calculate the risks of a license-based enterprise. A Hochtief project failed in 2001 because of the economic crisis in neighboring Argentina. The company lost millions. We're not talking about building a tunnel or a hydroelectric power station that takes three years and then it's finished for good. The license lasts 30 years. That means there'll be another five, six or seven governments in power before we can say we're finished now and now we want our investment back. We have to think about it from a totally different perspective. A large part of the work in the new San Cristobal tunnel has been completed. All in all, the building work took less than two years. But the actual mining work took a bit less than a year, some ten months. The concrete for the road is being laid and will soon be finished. This phase of construction is three months ahead of schedule. The motorway needs to last at least 30 years. That's when Hochtief's license will expire and the government will take control of it. Up until now, Chile has been a good place for Hochtief to work in. The economy is growing and the volume of traffic with it by 100,000 cars a year in Santiago alone. So the next 30 years could be good ones for Rüdiger Trenkler and Hochtief. Well, indeed, the order books for many German companies are full these days. Profits are healthy, and that has trade unions demanding a bigger share of the pie for workers, a share that they have not received in recent years. A new study reveals that corporate profits in Germany rose constantly in the last five years, but real income stagnated or sank. That simply means that companies are earning more, workers less. Well, in cooperation with the Handelsblatt, we examine how one industry is trying to bring the profit wage equation back into balance. Germany's steel union, IG Metall, is calling for a wage increase for 75,000 workers, and it has already staged warning strikes to get its point across. The workers can't do without their sausages. A warning strike on an empty stomach, impossible in the German steel industry. Around 1,000 steel workers have walked off the job and gathered outside Tussenkrupp in Bochum. They're demanding an 8% pay raise and an extra 100 euros for the trainees. Guido Kunze is fed up. He's been working for the steel company for 24 years, and he takes home 1,900 euros per month after tax. That's hardly a small fortune when you have a wife and three children. We have to cut back on spending, on groceries and holidays. We also have to put money aside for Christmas presents, birthdays and so on. We have to watch every single euro, every last cent. Many of his colleagues have the same problems. Prices are going up all the time and value-added tax has gone up too. I think we deserve an 8% raise. If our pay had gone up as much as the manager's salaries, then we'd all be happy. They made billion euro profits so they could give a bit more to us and not just take, take, take. The powerful metal workers union didn't have a hard time mobilizing the workers for this industrial dispute. Everyone wants a piece of the pie, and as big a one as possible. It's high time the steel workers had more money in their pockets. 
We need more? That's our motto. We need more. And we need it now, colleagues. At the moment, ThyssenKrupp is doing better than ever. Profits have risen steadily over the past five years. In the past financial year alone, the company earned over 2.2 billion euros, and experts say the profits will keep on rolling in. Management is currently earning 20% more than last year. Helmut Koch is not denying that. He's the employer's chief negotiator. But he doesn't want to discuss management salaries. He's been dealing with the unions for years, and he knows their arguments. So far, he hasn't made them an offer, and he's turned down their demands categorically. We have to be careful not to endanger our competitiveness, which we worked hard for. We shouldn't undermine it with excessive demands or excessive concessions on wages or salaries. Is 8% excessive? We think 8% is definitely excessive. It would damage competitiveness and, in the medium to long term, it would also put jobs at risk. Back to ThyssenKrupp, the Workers' Council is discussing how to follow up the warning strike. Everyone agrees the protest outside the factory was a success. So now they're preparing for an indefinite strike. Workers' councils and local union representatives are now being given training, so if no agreement is reached by the 19th of February, we'll be ready for a strike. The last major steelworkers' strike was almost 30 years ago. This year, the unions are preparing for another battle. And if you'd like to learn more about the labor unrest in Germany's steel industry, you can go to the website of Germany's leading business daily. You see it right there, handelsblatt.com slash DW, or you can visit our very own website at dwworld.de. Well, let's pull in Klaus Deutsch from Deutsche Bank Research. He's a familiar face here on Made in Germany. Good to see you, Mr. Deutsch. You know, we hear a lot about inflation eating up the modest rises that we have seen in wages in Germany. Do you feel that your money gets you less now? Uh, no, there's a difference between inflation that you feel and inflation that you can measure. And in terms of real purchasing power, there has been a slight increase in the last year, and we probably see a bigger increase this year. So this a slight increase in purchasing power. Uh, yeah. Then do you think the demands by the trade unions that we're hearing right now, are they justified? Well, they are a little bit ahead of the curve, but they certainly will settle for a substantial wage increase which will in turn also increase the ability of people to buy things. Well, and, and that's what we want, right? I mean, we hear right. all the time people say consumer spending has to be strengthened. Yes. For five or six years, we have seen all kinds of economic developments that strengthen exports and investments. Now we see developments that strengthen private consumption and consumer spending, which is good because it rebalances economic growth at the time of U.S. financial and economic crisis. Okay, let's, let's take a look at where we are headed right now in 2008. We've got a graphic here we want to show everyone. It's our monthly look at the DBI which is the German International Business Index. It's based on economic data from Germany, the U.S., and Japan, and it's created exclusively for DWTV. I mean, Mr. Deutsch, when we look at this, we see we saw a slump in the previous months and then a slight improvement in January. Why? It might have been the, fa the fact that uh, Christmas expectations for spending in the U.S. were sort of too uh, uh, bad, and mm -hmm. that, they, you know, now for the new year, uh, the managers who make sure that their stuff is on the shelf in, in U.S. shops are slightly more optimistic. And we have seen that German industry is still optimistic. They get a lot of orders from, uh, you know, the Middle East and uh, the Gulf region and uh, East Asia, East, Eastern Europe. So it's not as bad as it uh, looks like. Okay, I mean, that's a very positive outlook that you're giving there. I'm just wondering um, how that's going to fall out in the next couple of months, because we are here more about write-downs by, by banks that's coming in left and right. Corporate earnings are not very good, particularly from the United States. I mean, do you think the recession that people fear is happening in the U.S., is that going to continue? 
Well, we probably see until summer a series of weak data. I would expect the uh, index to decline until summer, but maybe, you know, due to the uh, sharp decrease of the interest rate by the Federal Reserve Board and mm. uh, due to the spending package that the U.S. Congress put together recently, uh, the worst might be over by summer this year and maybe the U.S. gathers steam uh, by autumn again and then the rest of the world can be relieved. Okay, that would be a, a nice summer if it indeed works out that way. Mr. Deutsch, as always, thank you very much. Welcome. A recession or not, how do you invest your money? Well, that is what we asked you last week. And Juan Pablo Cardona Restepo, now he's an engineer from Colombia. He wrote to us and he says that he diversifies his investments and that he avoids banks in Colombia that, that pay less than the interest rate, or less interest, I should say, than the country's 10% inflation rate. Juan, we want to thank you for your email. And now we'd like to know, do you think you earn enough money? Send us your thoughts. Just go to our website at dwworld.de, English made in Germany. That's all one word. Fill out the online questionnaire and you'll be qualified for our next drawing. And the prize will be the DVD, German Family Business. Well, our next report is about a small invention with huge importance. Now, you'll find it everywhere in London's Wembley Stadium, in most highways, even in your house. Now, I'm talking about this, the universal screw anchor. Now, it has many names, the wall fastener, the wall plug, but whatever you call it, it makes sure that nails and screws stay in place. Now, the idea originally comes from southern Germany, and that's where our reporters found the family that has turned making the nail anchor into a multi-generation tradition. Sometimes managing a successful business is just a matter of making sure everything's in the right place. Klaus Fischer is CEO of a company that makes nuts and bolts. He's on a permanent quest to improve his company's manufacturing process and perfect the finished product. Over the years, the Fisher Company has produced countless fixing solutions for a broad range of applications. Klaus Fischer is proud that these days, his company is a world leader in fixing technology, with production locations all over the world. Fischer took over the company, which is based in southern Germany, in the early 1980s. Fischer's father was a visionary who invented the world-famous plastic wall plug. His son knew he was a hard act to follow, so he decided to forge his own path early on. It was never an issue for me because I always said I would go my own way and that's what I did. It was the right thing to do. Everyone always asks me if my father was a daunting figure. To me, he wasn't. If he had been, I doubt I would have been so successful. Hardware store employees are learning about the finer points of wall plugs in the company's training center. It's all part of the company's quality control policies. The training center was set up by Fischer. He believes in fostering ties to his customers. It's one way of making sure his company remains competitive. We get a lot of feedback from customers. Think of it like this. If you have 4,000 customers, then their feedback gives you a lot of information about the market. And this information ultimately leads to the introduction of new products. We find out which products don't work so well, what can be changed, and what can be improved, the problems people are having with new materials, and so on. His company has learned to live with the fact that the market is flooded with cheap copies of Fisher products. That's why he's such a fervent believer in innovation. It will probably only be a matter of months before the first copies of these steel bonded anchors, for instance, hit the market. Complaining doesn't get us anywhere. That's the way the cookie crumbles. We just have to make sure our products are better than those made in China. That's the only solution. It's that easy. A qualified engineer himself, Klaus Fischer is happiest on the factory floor. One of his favorite subjects is Kaizen, Japanese for change for the better. 
It's a business strategy that aims to eliminate waste. Here's a simple example. Usually brooms are just left lying around somewhere, but that means people can't find them. No one knows where they belong. But if there's a place for the brooms, then everyone always knows where they are. If I have two brooms, then this is where they'll always be. That sounds kind of simple. Things are that simple. It's about keeping things neat and tidy. If you have a company with 100 employees and everyone spends a half an hour looking for things, you're losing 600,000 euros a year. We have 3,500 employees, so you can figure out how much we would lose if we weren't neat and tidy. Some call it being pedantic. Others call it being neat and tidy. Continual improvement is another Kaizen principle, and Klaus Fischer knows it's the key to a successful business. Well, the rocketing price of oil is putting the shipping industry under more pressure to save fuel. And help could now come from some very old technology, an enormous sail capable of towing a giant freighter over the waves. Now, it can save a container ship more than $2,000 a day in fuel costs. Engineers from Germany's Baltic Sea coast have been refining the cell's design for a decade now, and the giant cell is finally ready for its first trial run across the Atlantic. This is the first freighter ever to cross the ocean equipped with a sky sail. But the ship has to be out at sea before the kite-like sail can be hoisted. On the bridge, the crew is waiting for the right breeze. A wind speed of at least 8 meters per second is needed to raise the sail. This is the sky sail's debut performance, but the captain is showing no signs of stage fright. At the moment, I don't have much to do with it. Sky sails control the kite and the ship performs its normal maneuvers. Ultimately, we want it to be fully automated. And when we've got that far, then all I'll have to do is press the button up here and my sail will fly in front of me. Signs of nervousness below deck. Stefan Brabeck and his team of engineers have spent 10 years perfecting the sail. Now it's time to put it to the test. The freighter weighs 10,000 tons, so the 160 square meter sail has to be made of strong materials. These cords may look thin, but each one can bear 200 kilograms. The kite sail passes out of the ship through a hatch in the bow. Now comes the difficult part. The ship has to be turned into the wind so that the kite sail will rise instead of falling into the water. On the bridge, tension is growing because the winds directly above the ship are unpredictable. If the sky sail crash lands, 400,000 euros will have been lost. But once the kite reaches a certain height, it's all smooth sailing. We fly at a height of more than 100 meters above the boat, where the wind speed is relatively stable. Clearly, disruptions can occur. There are enough sensors so that the computer system, which is located in the gondola under the kite, can recognize these changes and navigate higher or lower. Even out here, the unusual sail attracts curious onlookers. But the helicopter's rotors create a whirlwind which could disrupt the kite's flight pattern. Helicopter for Beluga Sky Sails. Please don't fly over the sail. <laughs> the kite may look like a huge toy, but there's serious money at stake here. Five shipping companies are interested in the sale, and we have concrete plans for ships to be fitted with it. And we've received inquiries from all over the world. The kite is now flying at a height of 250 meters, and everything is working perfectly. If the wind keeps blowing at this rate, the ship could use 30% less fuel. 
That's around three tons per day, which would mean that over a 14-day period, we'd save a total of 42 tons. That's quite a bit. Yes, although you have to realize that you make the journey in two directions, there and back. And it could be that nothing happens on the way out. There could be no wind or too much wind. But the trip home might be a lot better. During their trip to Venezuela, the crew was gaining a lot of experience. <laughs> That's knowledge they'll later use to handle a sky sail four times as large as this one. Or smooth sailing. Well, that wraps up this edition of Made in Germany. We'll see you again next week.